What's good, Wager World? It's your boy Five Star in Vegas, broadcasting live as always for beautiful summer in Nevada. And then with my co host, my guy, the only Sacramento Kings fan that I know. What's good, Spreader Stay? How are you today? Oh, man, I'm great. Can't wait. I think this is an interesting weekend. I've been going back and forth on a lot of these games, so I can't wait to talk to you about them. Yeah, man, uh, let's not hesitate. I know everyone wants to talk about last night's game. Let's get right to the past, present, and the future. In the past, man, last night, the Chargers blow another one and uh, let the Mahomes uh, get a leg up on them in the AFC West in the game of control. Uh, I don't know what what Staley's doing, man. I don't I don't get it at all. Um, some of the plays that he called in the second half and how things kind of changed. Up. It wasn't a press performance by that defense. Uh, he definitely has built a team and a defense that's to give uh, Patrick Mahomes problems the rest of his career. And, you know, it's like those guys are young too. So it's going to be a great chess match over the next three to five years um, watching that charge defense with Brandon Staley, who's – He's one of those guys that's sharp, but he just can't keep his attention span. And I'll talk about it a little bit later about uh, some of the problems I have with what he did. But we did get in your under on that game. Great call by you. For a, for a, an under that was tra- – if you went to the live board, it was under almost the full game. Still one of the most uncomfortable bets, right? I mean, in no time did I really feel like I, I had it. Um, you know, it felt like I sweat the whole time, but we got there. And, boy, yeah. my takeaway is, man, as a Raiders fan, I still hate John Gruden for trading away Cleo Mack. I mean, to, to start your tenure with that, and it's still the biggest thing we take away from your tenure is that you made one of the worst trades, and then everyone says, oh, the draft capital. Well, draft capital is yeah. no good if you waste every single pick. Uh, it goes down if you just make it. not. You don't say first-round picks that are worth this many points in your little you know, uh, draft uh, trade grade model. Yeah. And do you see the players they took? Right. One of the worst trades uh, of all time. And, and he was dominant once again. And you combine him uh, with Joey Bosa, and they're going to be able to get pressure on anyone. So, uh, you know what I liked is it kind of made the Chiefs offense look pedestrian. And I don't think they are. I think the Chargers defense is really good. So we can go back to attacking them to score a lot of points in the weeks to come. Yeah. And remember what I said yesterday stop comparing uh, these two quarterbacks. Um, I think Mahomes showed and a lot of people were tweeting at me. Oh, he could have had five, six interceptions, but he didn't. That's it's only the only thing that matters is the final outcome of the game. And I think that the two touchdown passes that Mahomes made were only plays that he could make. Do you agree? Uh, that first yeah. was ridiculous when he was scrambling and eluding the defender and go sidearm between three guys on a dart. You know uh, who's. Who's going to make that play? Most of these quarterbacks in the NFL, that's the three points you're going to get out that um, position. And then he comes back and uh, he hits the guy on the 41-yarder. Some unknown kid that got in the paper, you know, got on ESPN with just a strike. Uh, once again, because he wasn't having a good pocket all game, Bosa and Mack were giving him hell. They were killing uh, Kansas City's line. He steps up. And as he's running forward, he just on the run throws a forty-one yard strike. I mean, you can't you could he couldn't have ran up and handed to the guy any better. Justin Herbert has a long way to go to be Patrick Mahomes. Uh, I sincerely don't think that um, that interception by the goal line was all on him. Um, I've heard some things about where the tight end was supposed to be, but me myself being a former quarterback, and I'm nowhere as was ever as good as Justin Herbert. He's a you know, freak of nature. I mean, the, the guys like, you know, Sunshine <laughs> from the movie, uh, the tight, good looking kid that can really ball out. He's fast, he can throw, but he has to be more instinctive right there. His eyes should have picked up that jersey flash before he let go of that ball. And I'll talk to you a little bit later about how upset I am for them even running that play on the one yard line. It doesn't even make sense. It's kind of like the Seattle situation with Russell Wilson that we talked about. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes they just try to pad these guys' stats, and, and when you do things with the wrong motives, they never turn out right uh, in, in anything in life, including sports. Got to win in, man. We didn't get the run line, but we did get the money line. Uh, they had so many opportunities to score late. 
I mean, once again, I told you these teams that are uh, out of are just ready to go home. Uh, Perez covered the run line with a home run. I think this was like his uh, third jack in his career against uh, Dylan Bundy. But besides that, Bundy was very sound. Uh, he held the Royals to uh, only two runs. And uh, Minnesota left a lot of men stranded, but they get the win. That's the only thing that matters for them as they try to chase down the Guardians. So we did go 2-0. and on the ball and parlay yesterday. Uh, if you played the Twins money line, if you played spreads under on the Thursday night football game, you parlayed them. All right, let's get to the present. Big uh, week coming up. Yeah. What are you looking at for this weekend's games? I know that there's some uh, that you like that we're going to give out during well, the Well, we got parlay. tonight first. Uh, we spoke okay. about it yesterday because, okay. uh, you know, we're used to the old schedule that was uh, Thursday night, and it probably goes back to that pretty soon. But right now, I guess they did something different. It was, the you know, one of the more premier Thursday night games, and I guess maybe the NFL asked the ESPN not to have a college football game. But uh, Florida State Louisville faced tonight. Uh, the Lions went up to plus three for Louisville at home. Close friend's son, who's a all, going to be an All American, I think this year, at least second or third team that plays for Louisville. I think he's going to have a good game this week. I think the Florida State's head's going to be blowed up just a little bit. They're not a team used to dealing with a lot of success, and they have had a very hard time with this same Louisville squad uh, over the past prior two years. Uh, Malik Cunningham has beaten them twice and beaten them pretty badly as the quarterback. Uh, for Louisville. He's had a lot of success against the Seminoles. Um, Jordan Travis is a good player, as I spoke about briefly yesterday, but um, I still like that plus three, man. I, I think uh, a home dog getting plus three on a crazy Friday night uh, could easily become a money line for the Cardinals. Uh, and the biggest matchup is probably going to be Oklahoma minus 11 at Nebraska. Uh, and they let go of Scott Frost, uh, as you know, after uh, they lost to Georgia Southern. This, Student section was cheering fire frost and uh, the AD listen this time. Did you know that he last year, in order to keep his job, <laughs> that he cut uh, his not only salary, not going to stand his salary, dropping a million. He went from a uh, five million to four. Do you know that on his buyout, he cut it in half? He went from $15 million buyout clause to uh, seven and a half million. And I'm sure he regrets that. I mean, seven and a half million is like $30 million in Las Vegas. So he'll be okay. In oh, Nebraska. <laughs> Come on, man. But 15 million, that's He's still, like the second man. richest person in the state besides Buffett. Be, yeah, Buffett but how, many, how much property can you buy with an extra seven and a half million? How many you know, more like, years is he going to live, though? I mean, <laughs> yeah, he's cool. But... Seven and a half. That's like, that's like having seven and a half million in like Costa Rica. Yeah, he's I in Nebraska. Just, I don't know, man, he does. He's not gonna live in Nebraska, spread. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's already out of there. He's probably back in Florida. <laughs> yeah, he's probably gonna go somewhere where he's getting, you know, more love. And that Florida air is way nicer to live in Florida for one. And two, he's got he's got a lot of love in that central area uh, from what he did with UCF with them having their imaginary national championship <laughs> that ended up getting him his job as alma mater. But I want to speak briefly about. Uh, Nebraska's coach, you know, have a side in this game. I think 11 points, though, is too much for Oklahoma to be giving up. After Nebraska got embarrassed at home to Georgia Southern, I just think they have enough talent and a good enough quarterback to keep it within that number. Oklahoma looks good. They have uh, uh, Brett Venables is, uh, once again, their new head coach, and uh, he's been doing an amazing job with the defense. I just can't see uh, Brett Venables um, just having that big an advantage, you know, with this team, because I've seen Oklahoma this year and they didn't pop to me. They they look decent, but I don't know, man. I don't know if Dylan Gabriel can beat uh, Nebraska by two touchdowns. Um, and once again, like I said, the cupboard was not bare. It's some players over there. They got a new head coach. It's their first black coach in the history of Nebraska, Mickey Joseph. Uh, got a soft place in my heart for him because he's uh, from Louisiana like myself. He's from uh, Marrera, New Orleans. He went to uh, Archbishop Shaw, which is uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, football programs in Louisiana. He also played quarterback for Nebraska. Uh, also coached at my alma mater, Grambling. A lot of ties through his career to things that uh, are dear to me, LSU. Um, but the most impressive thing about uh, Mickey Joseph is uh, he was working directly out of college at a uh, 
all boys school. It's called the Desire Street Academy. It's in Ninth Ward, uh, one of the roughest areas of New Orleans. And he was there mentoring kids and coaching them up and doing things like that. And Katrina comes and knocks a lot of these kids um, out of having a home. And, you know, some of them were separated from their family and things like this. He took 75 of those kids and raised them out in Florida. Uh, wow. You know, shout out to uh, Werfel, Andy Werfel. He also helped him pull that off. The uh, former Florida court quarterback and Washington Redskin, um, they were able to help these kids continue their education even after Katrina. So I'll be rooting a little bit for Mickey Joseph, man. He's the first black coach in Nebraska in their history, and I want to see him do well, man. So uh, I won't have a side on that game, but I'll be, uh, you know, have a little cheering uh, going on for the, the Corn Huskers this week. Also, we got the uh, number one team in the country, uh, the Georgia Bulldogs. They're going on the road to South Carolina. This is one I played, Spread. I gave it to you earlier. Uh, yeah, I bet it with you. Yeah, we went with 24 and a half. Uh, in the past uh, three matchups, Georgia's won by 28 points. Uh, Arkansas, man. W- just beat the hell out of South Carolina last week. They hurt like three of their defenders. Two of their starting linebackers are gone for the year. Um, they leaned on them, uh, put that big old line on them. And uh, Coach Pittman over there uh, in Arkansas, he really likes to run the ball. And he really plays a physical type brand of football. And that's bad news for South Carolina. You come from getting beat up, you know, for a whole uh, Saturday uh, in Fayetteville. And then now, you got the uh, national champs rolling in town, and they like they got attitude. As you know, uh, Kirby Smart's cold-hearted. He doesn't want to just beat you. He wants to dominate you. And uh, he takes really a lot of pride in that defense and being able to keep people out of the end zone. And I, I see the Georgia offense behind uh, Stetson Bennett, probably the best walk-on quarterback we've seen since Baker Mayfield in uh, <laughs> college football. I think he'll be able to uh, – put up some points. I think he'll be able to score 24 points, honestly, in the first half on South Carolina. And as the game goes, they're going to really be worn down. As I said, um, they lost a lot of people last week. That's important. You don't want to lose your two linebackers, your two starting linebackers, your middle linebacker, especially against a team with, like Georgia with such a great running game. Um, and I just think that Georgia Bulldogs defense is too dominant. Uh, spread, they're only giving up 1.5 points a game. <laughs> That's unheard of in college football. You know what I mean? So I think we're going to be pretty good on that. Let's get to your side of, of the world with the NFL. What you got, Spread? Yeah, talk to me about s- some of these games. Uh, what do you think about some of these line moves? Baltimore Ravens down to minus three. Uh, Dolphins getting a little bit of love. And I'm checking the injury report, and I'm thinking Ravens are having problems on the offensive line. What are your thoughts on that game? Ravens and Dolphins. The game's in Baltimore, Baltimore. right? Baltimore, yeah. Originally, I love the Ravens here, and I'm these injuries on their line are really worrying me. That line is telling you that the Dolphins is the play, don't you think? I mean, I like the Ravens here. I, I wasn't as impressed with with Miami's win over New England as other people were. I, I wasn't impressed at I all. Really I really downgraded New England. I wasn't impressed with the offense at all. Yeah, and the defense, it's hard to say. I think that could be a really bad offense without Josh McDaniels there. Maybe I'm looking too deep into it, but I just feel like that's a trap number. It's three and a hook, right? It's down to three. So the Dolphins, yeah, so everyone bought them off the hook. That's begging you to take the Ravens, man. And I've readjusted my mind on this NFL stuff, man. It's a market bet more than it is a, a matchup bet for me, man. And I just, that market is saying, screaming to take Miami on that game. Money line, actually, they're probably going to win the game if it stays at three because we got a super sharp, sharp coach in uh, McDaniels. I, re- I like him a lot. He's bringing something new. Harbaugh hasn't seen him. You know, he's one of those brainiacs. He has a million plays. They Some of the plays he's going to run this week, I'm sure they're not going to be um, something that the Ravens have seen before. As you said, the Ravens are having props on the line. They couldn't run the ball worth Jack last week, and then they're trying to force Dobbins back. He's coming off a knee. And Miami, you saw what they did on defense against New England. They look good on defense. I mean, yeah, my worry is that New England defense offense is just really bad. But how does Lamar throw on Miami? 
Miami's defensive backfield is outstanding. Yeah, that's true. I I just I don't know. I'll it's, be interested. Kind of like I, I ta- we touted up Miami's defensive backfield last year, and they got torched a couple <laughs> times. They're not. They're not. They got, a, they got a new coach, man. You got a new coach until he loses. Oh I got to, you know, praise everyone him. loves that guy. Okay, cool. Well, that's fine. Um, that Never actually helps you me off. keep off because I was thinking <laughs> the Ravens and now we're off. Um, Jets and Browns. I want to talk about during ball and parlay okay. commanders and lions. I don't really love this game. Just wanted to point out the commanders have taken money. They were out to two and a half uh, earlier this week, back down to one. Are you surprised the commanders are taking money? The game's in Detroit, right? Yeah. I think Detroit is one of those teams, like I said earlier in the year, that try hard, but I think they always figure out how to lose the game. Yeah. So unless Wentz has like four interceptions in the first half, which he can do, the commanders are, are can win that game fairly easy. I agree with you there they're too. They're underrated, think, man. And they're underrated by the players. And I think Carson to... Wentz is is underrated right now too. Not that yeah. he's a good quarterback. Not that he's ever going to win you a Super Bowl, but. Like with Baker and Carson, we both said, oh, well, these guys probably can't lead you to a Super Bowl unless you just have a really good team around them. But they're not like backup level guys. And I think that's how we're we're treating them, where I think they're right in the middle of the pack. And there's a lot of starters that they're better than. So I'm not a big Carson Wentz guy at all. But I think the market has actually downgraded him too much because he hasn't lived up to draft expectations. Whereas if you just take it in a vacuum, he's probably between like 15th and 20th. In the NFL, and, and if you think about it, and I hate to say this because I like golf so much more, but I think I'd rather have Carson Wentz than Jared no, Goff. No, you, you want to have Wentz over golf. You know why? Golf is a good system. I mean, what does golf guy, do though? But he doesn't do anything well except for throw the ball if he's playing seven on seven and he has a clean pocket. If the pocket gets muddy, he's finished. He's got a ball up. He can't run. He's not athletic. Yeah. Carson Wentz's problem is from the neck up. Carson Wentz from yeah. the neck down is one of the best dudes you want to have. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, at least there's like, hope. Like, he's tough what, as what are we nails. He's strong. Here? He's fast. He can yeah. throw any pass. That dude can ball. It's just he's a head case. He's one of those guys. At first, it was a superhero mentality at Philly where he wanted to be the guy that made everything happen and get the – you know, the praise and thought that that's what quarterback in the NFL was. And then later from dealing with Philadelphia and how those fans are and the way that they cover football out there, he got such a sickness um, for going to work every day that now it became to, I don't give a damn, you know. And if he's in Washington and gets back his mentality of trying to succeed, trying to, he has the right coach over there, a, a very good coach when it comes to dealing with players and, being that he's no nonsense, you know, uh, Ron Rivera doesn't play any games, but he's also a nice guy, you know. So um, I think Carson Wentz might surprise some people this year. He definitely has the weapons. They, McLaurin's a big-time receiver. I think they beat the hell out of the Lions, honestly. Now, the Lions might come back like they did against the Eagles last week and make a push where it looks like it was close. Man. Jacksonville was actually out at four and a half at one point. Every time it touched four and a half, moved back. Down to three, though. Not sure if this is because Darius, a.k.a. Shaquille Leonard, uh, might be out now or just the fact that everyone's heard, you know, if we've all done the reading and, and listened to the radio on the podcast, you know, Indianapolis hasn't won in Jacksonville since 2014. Indian, I don't know. So what do you make of that performance against the Texans? I mean, they had 500 total yards. They only put up 20 points. I'm not high on Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan's old. That's what I got. Yeah, I, Matt Ryan, his best days are behind him. Um, yeah, you know, I'm getting a better quarterback at home. I understand why the money's coming in here. Maybe there'll be some buyback on the Colts, but I kind of like the Jaguars here, even though it's like the trendy dog. Of- I love the way that uh, the coach GM, he's a Houston boy, awesome dude. I love how he runs the organization. What I do have a problem with is him at quarterback. He can't find a quarterback for Jack. Um, they got rid of Wentz because of Wentz's attitude more than his play even. Um, but you can't go to Matt Ryan. You can't go to Phillip Rivers. You know, they're, they're too old with the team. You got to win now, team. These quarterbacks that you have, you would have did better um, attempting to grab one. You grab Jimmy G. That's why I was just, you took it out of my mouth. They yep. should have gave up every draft pick this year to get Jimmy G because he would fit perfect. He's in the dome, so his, his week on not affect it as much. And, um, you know, he has a great team around the Colts. Offensive line strong, running game strong, great receivers. 
great defense, but they need Leonard. Leonard is the key to it. If he's not there, the defense lacks. Um, but I definitely think that uh, Jacksonville might cover that game. You know, when you have uh, psychological issues with certain venues, mm -hmm. you know, they never go anywhere. And for some reason, that place has been a nightmare for the Colts. They literally blew a playoff. Think about it. If they win that game last year, Winston's still the quarterback there. Yeah. Good point. You know, Great point. Yeah. 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 So, you know, they have some problems for some reason uh, in Jacksonville. And Jacksonville is like a college atmosphere. Those fans are going to be wired up. They have a lot of hope this year with my guy from Monroe, Louisiana, Doug Peterson, running the uh, – being a coach there now. Yeah, Super I think Bowl he's going to help Lawrence a lot. Uh, hopefully this comes back. It might not, though. This might be the trendy pick of the week. Give me the inside information. You talked about Louisiana. I need to know status of Winston, status of Kamara. Uh, the line is telling me nothing's changed. Those reports out of New Orleans worried me. Uh, Winston going to be okay? How, and how's Kamara going to do? Winston's going to have to be in a cast not to play. He's playing. Kamara. Is he going to be as good as he was last week, or is he going to be a, a shell of himself? Um, They're going to have to figure out some ways to get some cheap ones because that's what this game is going to come down to, who gets the cheap touchdown because, or who gets the big turnover. Um, as we know, this is going to be a defensive affair. If I was a total bet, I'd bet the under, but I'm so jinxed out on totals that I'll lose it still if I bet it. I just can't bet totals for some reason. But the off the muscle, I think under on this game. Um, the Saints defense gives Tom Brady more problems than any defense in the history of the NFL. Head coach uh, Dennis Allen is the only coach to ever shut out Brady in his whole career. You know, Allen was the coach for that one game uh, when they beat them nine to zero in Tampa Bay and it was uh and you know Brady throwing the middle finger and it was mad and stuff but uh he's the only guy in the history of the NFL uh to keep Brady scoreless so they can't wait um uh, in New Orleans for the Tampa Bay to pull up Mike Evans is not Mike Evans against the Saints he can't do anything for some reason uh, our cornerback just has his number you know, it's nothing that he can do with them. He can, he, they have fights every game, and he still can't get open. It's no matter what he does. And uh, this time they don't have Chris Godwin as his backup. Usually Chris Godwin comes in and has a good game because Mike is always immediately just eliminated from this game. You can just take him off, uh, off the score sheet. But now they don't have Chris Godwin. They don't have Russell Gage. So the – the Bucs are banged up themselves, and they faced the Cowboys team last week who really couldn't affect them um, the same way the Saints can defensively. The Bucs have a beat-up offensive line. It wasn't exposed as much last week. It'll be really exposed. This the Saints have a plethora of D linemen that they can rotate in, and all of them can go. And uh, Cam Jordan has been a nightmare for Tom Brady. He probably goes to sleep and thinks about him. So, Brady's going to be shook this game. He's going to come out trying to pretend he's fired up. His mind is going to tell him he can do it and to be very motivated because he's a competitor. But when the clock starts and the lights come on, it's going to be a different ball game. And it's going to go back to kind of what we just said about, you know, psychologically, he's had nightmares. He's lost the last seven games to the Saints in the regular season. The only game that won wasn't a, a one-division playoff that they were able to pull out because uh, of, Drew Brees didn't play well that game. Now, I'll be on the Saints, but as you said, the injuries do concern me. Uh, but they have enough bets. If they can pop just a couple touchdowns, sustain a few drives, take some heel, make something happen a little bit, or uh, Jarvis Landry, you know, they can do something, get a turnover. They won't need but 20 points, I think, to win this game. All right. Here's a dog I like. I want to hear your thoughts on this one. Panthers catching two and a half in New York. Yeah, New York got that good win over the Titans, which is a defense that I rate highly. But, uh, boy, I keep downgrading that offense week after week. And I don't think a guy like Tannehill can afford the loss of A.J. Brown. He actually needs a big receiver. He's not Mahomes. He's not just going to absorb it. And <sighs> Baker Mayfield, to me, is probably better than Tannehill is now. They're coming off a loss, but Mayfield seemed like he was getting in the groove with this offense in the second half. Uh, rather than try and run the ball like Tennessee did against 
uh, this Giants defense. They're going to be more vulnerable to the pass. I like Carolina to bounce back, but the game is in New York, and Saquon Barkley looks pretty good. I haven't bet it yet, but I'm leaning Carolina. What do you think? If the weather's uh, windy, like how it gets in New Jersey and East Rutherford around this time of the year, um, if that wind's coming off the water, you got, you know, that wind's flying through the stadium crooked, I like the Giants. Because as you've seen before, Baker Mayfield, he doesn't uh, perform well in uh, outdoor conditions. His arm isn't that strong. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I, I have no the Panthers linemen. The Panthers line didn't look too good the first half. Like, I think that they were able to move the ball a little bit more at the end of the game because the Browns got tired on defense. Yeah, but, but New York doesn't have any pass rushers like Miles Garrett. I true. mean, just that right there is yeah. going to make things easier because you're not going against the top five guy anymore. So I, I think their line will look a little better. Um, Thibodeau might be back, may, you know, maybe, but that's not the same as, as uh, Miles Garrett that gives it to you playing and play. Why are the Steelers plus two and a half? I don't get this one at all. They're playing New England, right? Yeah. Why? Why? How is this moving? This was uh, minus one all week, and now it's two and a half. I'm checking the injury report. I didn't see anything crazy TJ here. Watts out. Yeah, but we already knew that. I mean, we we known that since the line came out. No, nobody posted that line thinking TJ Watt was going to play. I don't get it. Najee Harris worth a point and a half. I mean, maybe because his backup it is a downgrade, but the I don't know. At Heinz Field, right? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'm thinking is Belichick's always done good against Tomlin. Not this year. They're going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> I, I, I think so, too, man. I can't believe I'm catching points or a plus 120 yeah. money line. Mac Jones going to throw here. some interceptions and do some fumbles and all that stuff. I, I don't even like Trubisky, but I might like him better than Mac Jones. Well, because... I think that the receiver is going to get have some success against New England because you want Trubisky in this type of situation just because what does uh, coaches like Bill and Chicken Saban uh, have problems with? Second reaction quarterbacks because yeah. they're awesome. They can't them. plan for it. You can't plan for it. Everything else, they're ready for it because they got so much tape on Trubisky. They know everything he doesn't like to do. But when they get to him and he does one of those athletic things he might do with spin out and then he rolls right and then you get one of the Steelers quick, fast receivers breaking the other way and then they can throw it over the top and that's a free touchdown. The Steelers have that type of offense to do that against the Patriots that where it can go against all uh, normal thinking because that's how they pretty much score is playing like street ball, playing, you know, backyard football. Ever since Big Ben's been there, didn't really run plays well, just made things happen. So, you know, I think the Steelers, they're going to be very focused because it's the Patriots and the Patriots have a down team this year. I think Tom will be looking to make sure that they're focused and ready to beat that team. Yeah, I mean, and, and talk about losing an offensive coordinator. It's not that McDaniels is that good. It's just the replacement's that bad. So, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, if they would have brought in like Joe Brady or something, they'd be like, okay, fine. Okay, right. you lost McDaniels, you know, make it work. But you brought in two a uh, defensive coordinator, special teams coordinator. You have no weapons. I mean, arguably the worst wide receiver room. And two terrible know. communicators. There's no way that you can uh, be an OC, especially now uh, the way yeah. the NFL is ran. Did you hear on Manning cast how Shannon Sharp was talking about how sensitive these guys are now compared to when he played? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, I, yeah. I watched the. He uh, was playing after out. I saw Troy was understand. on there. I wanted to watch Monday night because I like Troy. I like how Troy, oh, okay. Troy tries to pattern himself after Madden. He's not like Madden, but he attempts to give you the inside of the game like that. So I really like yeah. him and Buck together. Yeah. Well, uh, Sh Shannon Sharp was making a good point. It's not like when he played. These guys are a lot more sensitive, and you can't necessarily take that old drill sergeant attitude. It doesn't play. Um, no. The same way. Now, whether or not that's good or bad, that's up for debate, but that's the way things are. So, all right, we agree yeah. on the Steelers. The Falcons down to 10. I thought that the Rams would be more popular here, but everybody's betting the Falcons here. Man. So, originally, I saw the line. I won the Falcons. I mean, it was, it was 13 and a half. Mm -hmm. Now it's down to 10. It goes a half point more. I got to take the Rams, man. I think they're going to bounce back. They played the best team in, in the NFL. Um, I know Kansas City looks good, and I think Kansas City matches up well against Buffalo. Uh, but just against like a neutral rat random opponent to me right now, I have Buffalo ranked the highest. So I, I think the Rams are going to look a lot better. Plus, plus uh, 10 days, they know they got to work Allen Robinson in. I think 
you know, they were kind of babying Stafford. I think the urgency will be back there for him to get the reps, even if it's uncomfortable, uh, because otherwise the season is lost here. So uh, I do like the Rams to bounce back. Hey, keep betting the Falcons. Keep betting the Falcons, please. Uh, I, I want this at nine and a half. Or you can give me back to the 13 and a half. I mean, I think that original 13 and a half was good. I see why people were betting it originally. Uh, but you get me out that key number of 10. I'm leaning towards the Rams. What do you think? Am I mistaken here? Is Arthur Smith and Marcus Mariota going to get things done against L.A. Rams? I would have to take the Falcons if I was the better side, but I'm not. And simply just because you and I both know the history of double-digit dogs in the NFL, if you bet them blindly. But, but here's one thing. In week two, last four years, 57%. Mm-hmm. It's not like uh, 90%, but still, mm-hmm. they have been covering in week two for the last four years. Yeah, that, that scares me because the Rams now are more name than game. And they have to show me something different because I think that they were one of the least dominant NFL teams to win Super Bowl. Like, they could have easily lost to the Bengals. They could have easily lost to the 49ers. And don't get me wrong, most of the seasons, especially lately, have been like that. But they just were a team that had the right breaks at the right moment. Um, But now they're missing uh, some key pieces. Um, Most of all, uh, that big tackle from Monroe, Louisiana. You know, they're missing him. And he was the leader of that team. He was the one that kept that locker room uh, on point and focused. The guy's like a 15-year veteran. Now you got a kid wet behind the ears playing his position um, that's a little bit over his head. And you're missing OBJ. And whether you like him or hate him, he's one of the most dynamic players in football and one of the smartest receivers. He knows how to get open. And that's why he worked immediately so well with Matt Stafford. Um, now you're having to trust a guy who's lost a step. Uh, I think we can agree that Allen Robinson isn't the same guy he was when he came to lead. Uh, he gave his best years to the Bears. Um, and then you got a coach, as I told you, he's going to force feed Cooper Cup because he loves him so much. Um, he's gave no explanation for not playing Cam Akers last week. Just he needs to get his stuff together. So like I told you, some personal stuff they got into it in uh, practice or something. And for sure, that the way that for sure the way that came out. Yeah, yeah. And, and, he said and something he, to him. Akers probably talked back, and now now they're yeah. not they're not happy. Yeah, but this is the problem though. This is the problem. You can't become the disciplinarian all of a sudden, but you've been there, everybody's homeboy the last two, three years. You know what I mean? Like, you can't just switch up like that. It was a different way that they could have probably got that handled. Um, but that's going to linger over their head because whether people know it or not, especially with the second receiver being gone and now they're so pedestrian at wide receiver, they need Cam Akers. He's big in the past. I, I agree with you there, you know, but let me – let me offer this. You know what else is going to linger over a team's head? And that's that loss to the New Orleans Saints, which we know that's the rivalry game, right? So it means right. more than a normal loss. And I right. know it's new players, and I know it's a new coach. I got you. But it's the, the same feeling yeah. in the city. We blew it again. Here right. we go again. We blew but, it again. Were they impressive to you last week? Because we know the Saints are one of the best teams in the league. They were very impressive to me. The Falcons impressed me, especially on defense. Yeah, I thought they looked good. I thought they looked good on the line. But at the same time, they all they were at home. Everything went their way, and they still couldn't get it done. Falcons I'm just worried this snowballs. <laughs> all right, we'll be opposite on this one, but that, that's a good <laughs> conversation there. Uh, wow. Uh, the Seahawks, another dog uh, that is popular, although now money's coming back um, the other way. Um, Niners lane nine at home. I'll tell you what, it's easier for me to think of reasons not to back each of these teams than it is for me to think of reasons to back them. For the Seahawks, uh, they should have lost that game for three different reasons. Two goal line fumbles, and then, of course, the coach being – completely bad and most of us feel the way that they were moving the ball Russell Wilson was going to get that done that that team was going to lose two so it's a huge lit down emotional win like I said with the Falcons losing to the Saints means that much more beating their old quarterback probably had a Super Bowl feel look like a Super Bowl celebration after the game listening to those quotes but then I go to the other side and I know that we're going to be opposite here and, and I think that people 
our confusing potential um, for his career, for the potential results this week, and that's in Trey Lance. And I think that, yes, he's still got a chance to be an absolutely great quarterback, um, but he has so little experience here. Um, it's just tough to back a guy that's had, what, like 400 competitive passes uh, out since he left high school. Uh, still not a lot of experience there. I don't know where to land because, like I said, I think these are both compelling arguments on both sides. I think it's a huge letdown spot for Seattle. At the same time, I don't know if I want to lay nine points uh, with a quarterback as inexperienced as Trey Lance in a division game where these coaches know each other so well. Uh, which way are you leaning on the Seahawks and the Niners? If I had to play a side, I'm playing the Niners. You're coming off a loss. They're coming home. Um, a dominant defense that I just – Geno Smith played the game of his life in the first half, and then he became more like himself in the second half. And I think that continues in this uh, matchup where I think the 49ers turn Whose over. defense do you like better, Niners or Broncos? Early Niners, but I don't know about – for in, in by personnel, it's supposed to be the Broncos by okay. personnel, but I like the Niners, how they looked uh, better. And they have the key component, that's that middle linebacker who can, you know, chess match with the quarterback. Every great uh, defense has a great uh, middle linebacker, a, a legit defense that can actually affect the game and shut down other offenses, um, not just hold them, hold them off and, you know, just try to keep the game within 30 points. And that's, you know, Fred Warner's amazing. So, um, I like the 49ers in this game. If I had to lay aside, I probably wouldn't play it either. And I definitely like the under. What's the under? Like 40, probably? It's 40. Yeah. So, yeah, I like the under in that game. How, how do the Seahawks score? Like, let's be for real. We said that against the Broncos, though, and they got it, it done. The occasion where it was a primetime game, the public was all on. Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson hadn't gotten the any public's going to be all on the Niners again, though. I, I don't Daniel know. Hackett there was a first-time coach, and we didn't know that he was going to be such an imbecile. I don't think he's going to get that much smarter in one week. No, what I'm saying is Shanahan is not an imbecile, so <laughs> that's not going to be. Oh, okay, okay, be okay. Great the point there. Okay, I, yeah, I, I, all these I was just all benefited. I don't know what I was thinking about the Broncos Texans. Uh, no, 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 that all that all benefited the Seahawks. Okay, I'm fine staying off that game. Just wanted to get your thoughts. Um, you know, I like a lot of dogs this week, but this is a game that I want to be square. I want to take the road favorite. The Bengals in the bounce back spot against the Cowboys, who I think are demoralized. And I think that some of the players have probably tuned McCarthy out and thinking, boy, if we just lose a couple more games, maybe we can get rid of this idiot. Uh, I, he doesn't seem that that popular uh, among the players. Uh, didn't give a lot of fight. They came out looking bad. Dak got hurt. You know, sometimes they rally around them. They didn't seem to rally for, for anything here. Uh, and I know it's square, but I mean, sometimes these favorites are going to get it done. Uh, I think Joe Burrow is going to have a huge bounce back spot here uh, after that rough game against Pittsburgh. But Pittsburgh knows that team so well. Tomlin knows the Bengals so well. They set their team up to compete with the Bengals when you're looking at how, how are we going to compete in the NFC North? Yeah. You're going to look at your division rivals, just like, you know, the Niners are set up to beat the Rams. And, you know, everyone in the AFC West is set up to beat the Chiefs. Um, so I think that the Cincinnati's are going to look great this week. Uh, you know, if you want to take the Cowboys and be contrarian, be my guest. I don't think they get it done. What do you think? Seven and a half. It was already out to nine. Cowboys are taking money. I can't believe it. Seven and a half, a big number, but still, I would look for props on Joe Burrow on that game. As you were speaking of, I think he has a big bounce back game. Yeah. Um, or Bengals think- team total over. Yeah, yeah, I like that more than I would like a side on. That seven and a hook, usually the seven hook ends up being a blowout, but uh, it's just a weird number because Cooper Rush has got some snaps. He still has some players on the outside to throw the ball to, you know. Um, You're right, though. It doesn't seem like – and they didn't, they didn't line at seven and a half. They actually had it at nine. Um, yeah. But whenever they throw up that seven in the hook, a lot of times don't you feel that their numbers really came out to eight, nine, or ten, but yep. they didn't want to put Every that time. number out. That seven so the they hook just always said, turns oh, we'll like catch him with the hook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot, yeah. I like laying seven and a half a lot more than, yeah, than other too. people Yeah, me too. Me too. Seven and a half turns, especially in college, seven and a half always like a 30-point win. <laughs> All right, let's get the two coaches that received some criticism this week. Uh, Nathaniel Hackett's was well-deserved. Everyone 100% agrees. Some debate around Levy Smith's decision uh, to punt in overtime. You're, you know, still talk to everyone in Houston, uh, fans that are your friends that you interact with. 
what is the feeling around Levy Smith's decision? Because um, some people think it was smart, right? I mean, if you don't punt there, all they need is one completion, right? Yeah, you got to punt there. I was watching so the game. people aren't five. upset with him? Yeah. No, not okay. any not any people who are sensible. The only people who are upset with him are people who didn't want him as the coach anyway. You see what okay. I mean? So, yeah. The, so they're not finding any reason that, to be mad. A minority group in um, Houston because the, the city pretty much is taking a liking to them. When they come from um, the incompetence of uh, David Cully, excuse me, you it makes Lovey Smith look like a genius. You know, he's had the team organized. They're flying around. They look like they're coming out with a plan, you know. So uh, I think the city of Houston is really happy with Lovey Smith. And I like uh, the Texas a lot this week. I don't think that they're going to go and get blew out. I don't think. I don't they, think so either. I think that's this game goes down to the fourth quarter. Um, Davis Mills is going to have to step up. He's going to have to play uh, more than just the first half of football. He's going to have to play four quarters. I think he's getting a lot of heat this week uh, for that fumble because everyone knows they don't lose that game if he doesn't turn that ball over. He's what can he do? He gets blindsided, but you have to protect the ball as a quarterback. That's why you do drills over and over where they hit you from the blind with the dummies. I know a little bit harder, but it's all about squeezing the football. He has big enough hands to keep control of the football in that type of situation. And uh, he just has to protect the ball better, man. And if he does that, they'll have a game plan that that their game plan will be successful against Denver just because I've seen what I need to see out of Nathaniel Hackett. You had the whole offseason to get together that offense with all of those pieces that you have and with the type of quarterback that you're supposed to have and that's what you put up against Seattle in a game that your quarterback had to be highly motivated. I think that thing you had that might be a little bit over his head. You know, we've seen this before where these coaches come in and um, you thought that they were ready, but they really weren't until the bright lights, lights come on. You're like, this guy, he, he's, he's like, he doesn't know what to do. Like, he, he's scared. And love is a sound vet. Like I say, he has that grandest beard for wisdom. He's a pretty wise dude. He's been around the NFL a long time. A lot of people don't realize he's been to two Super Bowls, one as a coordinator and one as a head coach. And I feel like anyone who gets Rex Grossman to a Super Bowl deserves <laughs> – he deserves a praise. So uh, we know that Lovey knows what he's doing. So I like the Texas plus 10, man. I wouldn't be surprised if many Houstonians fly to Vegas every weekend that that number's like nine before uh, kickoff. So I might have to get in on that, me and the Supreme clientele um, today. Cardinals, Raiders. Uh, Cardinals taking a little bit of money. That's fine. The look ahead was three and a half, moved out to six and a half without really a, a lot of injuries um, because everyone knew those injuries when we had the, the look ahead here. You know, no DeAndre Hopkins still. I'm like fine with it. I'm like, keep, keep betting here on the Cardinals. I don't love the number, but I do think that the Raiders bounce back. Uh, but you're a lot higher on Kyler than me. Do you think yeah. the Cardinals can cover this or maybe even upset the Raiders? With Kyler, you never know. Because he's very competitive. He doesn't say much. He doesn't, you know, brag or he doesn't say what he's going to do. He's a pretty quiet guy. We've seen this before, though, um, after a bad performance where he comes back and makes people remember why he is who he is, you know. So the Raiders just got to be careful that game. I think I'm going to be at that game. My homeboy Ash is coming to town, and uh, he's a huge Raiders fan. Shout out 713 Motor. We down to the wheels fall off, you know, 713 Life. That's our company together. He um, He's a huge Raiders fan, so he's coming in time to go to the game. I think I'm going to tag along. I think I'm going to go. Um, but Kyler Murray, he's the truth, so you can never count him out. He had a bad performance last week, but that's one week. And as we saw from last night, the Chiefs got a pretty good defense. And if you notice, Pat Noel, he knows what he's doing, and now he's been there um, and pretty much – Andy Reid has made him like the assistant head coach, so he's able to pick his own pieces, and he puts together a great defense over there. They reload. Um, so Kansas City uh, was a tough matchup for them. They'll make a lot of people look bad. So we'll see how it goes. I, yeah. I am big on the Raiders, though. I like the Raiders. I definitely won't bet this game. I'll just be watching it as a fan. Yeah, my concerns here with Kyler is without DeAndre Hopkins, he hasn't had the best money, uh, best numbers. But at five, this is really getting me off it. We saw how my, how key uh, those numbers were last night, you know, from moving to, to three and a half to the four and a half. And, you know, Arizona be up for this game. 
They'll be up for this game. I heard the Raiders will be up for this game, too, though. I mean, they're coming off a lot. Arizona got embarrassed, though. That's the difference. Arizona, the the Raiders didn't get embarrassed. To a certain extent, Derek Carr got embarrassed. I mean, that was an embarrassing performance. That's who he is. (laughs) I know. It's so rough as a fan where I know, like, just thinking about this morning, I'm like, how many years have we kind of wasted? We would have been better off just being one of the worst teams in the league and getting the top pick and addressing this. Gruden wanted Kyler Murray. We don't want Kyler. He's not going to be good. We're going to disagree about this. Fred. He's too small. This is the National Football right. League. Go play in the CFL. I mean, I mean nah. he's too small, man. He's not going to get no it done. Thing. Have you he's seen not that gonna, kid's every feet year. Every year strength. by November, he's going to be so beat up. He's getting everyone who's on the field with him is like fifty so, pounds heavier than him. Supreme athlete. Best yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it matters. Week. I don't think it matters. It's a physical sport. This is the NBA where you can he'll get by win an MVP on before he retires. Remember if he does, goal. it's gonna it'll, he'll lose in the first round still. Let's see if we're opposite on the last game of the night, and then we'll get into the future. Chicago Bears catching ten at home uh, against the Packers. Um, this is a spot where I don't like the double digit dog here. I think the Rodgers and these guys bounce back. They kind of got off to a bad start. You know, Rogers can kind of pout, right? I almost feel like he's like started pouting after homeboy dropped that pass uh, right off the bat. Uh, hopefully, Alan Lazard is back. See, here's the thing. We got to wait on this game because uh, Packers have two tackles on their injury report um, that we're not going to know about. So I'm fine not get, getting involved. But if those guys are back, I'll lay, you know, even if it moves to 11 or 12, uh, I'm going to lay it with Green Bay. I think they're going to smash Chicago. I think that Chicago... Uh, benefited from, like I said, a quarterback who's not 100% ready. And then, of course, those wacky, wacky um, conditions. So you pretty much throw that whole game out. Let's just go back to our priors before the season. Other than Seattle, we thought this was going to be one of the worst teams in the league. Uh, I still like Green Bay to go over 11 games. Um, and, you know, I'm not surprised that they struggled in, in this first game. But all it takes is a catch or two, get this thing rolling, get these guys out ahead. Packers are back on track with every all the criticism they heard this week, too. I think that gives them a little more incentive um, to run up the score in the third and the fourth quarters. They want to get these guys some reps. I like the Packers here for Sunday night, uh, laying it. I'm going to be square there. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with just Packers or nothing. Aaron Rodgers will be uh, ready to be a front runner. Uh, Colin Cowherd, as you know, is probably my favorite um, media, sports media guy. I've listened to him for a long time, and he always, um, for years, talked about Aaron Rodgers being a front runner, and about how Aaron Rodgers never could bring the team back. That yeah. if he gets down, it's over. He's not that's then that's why he never liked him as a quarterback. And I kind of agree with him on that. I I know knew like as soon as they were down in the first quarter, they're setting people up with the three on the second half. The Packers aren't going to fight because he's not going to fight. Uh, he's going to just look at it as just another game, and it's all we'll get him next week. But he will uh, go and play for his brand, you know, this week. It's a national televised game. All eyes are going to be on him, so I'm sure he have a uh, – And he always game. beats the Bears. I mean, this yeah, is – Yeah, he right owns game, the right? Bears. Yeah. So, yeah, it's that size Packers are nothing for me. All right. Let's move on to the future. Uh, the man you want to talk about is actually playing – against uh, Felix Auger Alisi May right now in the Davis Cup. Mr. Carlos Zacharias, what do you got for us? Yeah, I don't I don't watch the Davis Cup. Only time I watch Tim I don't is either. I just have it on because there's nothing else is on. <laughs> but uh yeah Alcarez, I think he's a lock to win the French Open. I think that now he's got his first major on this belt. Um he's clearly uh the best player on clay. He had a ridiculous record on clay this year. That's why uh, Bever was under the full belief after he defeated him in the French Open this year that it was going to be his first Grand Slam until he had the misfortune of having a pretty severe injury when he was controlling the match against Nadal. Uh, Nadal is on his last leg. I don't know where he's going to fly to this time to try to get some miracle uh, formula, but I don't think even if he gets any plays that he's going to be able to beat um, Alcarez. Uh, Alcarez... um, it's just uh, coming of age. He's coming into his moment. He's about to be the best player in the world. I think that similar to Eager, uh, the place he's going to really lay a stake uh, and pretty much plant his flag as his tournament every year is going to be the French Open. So I expect Alcaraz at plus 160 to win the French Open. As you know, when we get to the tournament by next year in June, it, it's just a good investment because by then every match he plays is going to be minus 700, minus 500. Minus 300. 
So uh, plus 160, I think, is a really good number. The only uh, player that may uh, contend with him on clay is uh, Dominic Team, if he can ever get his game back together. But he is, he's still a ways away uh, right I'm now. I'm not counting on that. I am yeah. not counting on player that. I think that's from. a great – Yeah. I mean, that, and it's injuries. It's not like anything happened. Yeah. It's not like he started partying or, yeah. you know, wasn't paying attention to his game. I mean, he suffered a severe injury, and it's a wrist injury, and the way yeah. his game is, it, it's just the worst he possible. Needs, it's like, yeah. yeah, it's like Nadal needs his legs. So yeah. I'm with you there. I think that's a great number. I didn't even know. I thought he'd be minus 110 already. Uh, so you've got a great find right there. I'm with you, Alcaraz, to win the French Open. It's time for everybody's favorite segment. Let's talk about what you saw last night uh, with Mr. Brandon Staley. All right, let's kick the damn extra point, man. Brandon Staley, this guy's a multiple award recipient. <laughs> he will be one last year for that decision to go for the fourth down. Gets the ball. He's controlled the game. I'm like, look at Brandon Staley. I'm proud of him the whole first half. Like, man, he's not going to be on kick the damn extra point ever again. Like, this kid <laughs> I'm like, yeah, these guys ready, man. Uh, Mahomes makes a huge pass in the third quarter. That 41 yard we spoke about earlier completes it. So uh, now it's tight, 17-14, and everybody in the casino and everybody at home is tight. Like, okay, now what are the Chargers going to do? They have an excellent drive. Staley's OC or whoever's calling plays over there calls a great play to Everett for like 40 yards, and they're right at the goal line. They get to the one-yard line and decide to run a fade pattern to their tight end from the one-yard line. Who is exhausted and asking to come out of the game? who was exhausted, asking to come out the game, and then, to make matters worse, literally Amazon had just showed a stat that Austin Eckler was tied with someone like Jerry Rice and Ivan Smith <laughs> for the most touchdowns in primetime history. He has 12 touchdowns in primetime. And you don't give the ball to Austin Eckler, one of the best touchdown machines that the NFL has seen. He led the league in touchdowns last year. You don't give him the ball. Instead, you let Sunshine throw a fade to your exhausted tight end because you want to make sure that Justin Herbert's stats say that he had a touchdown, another touchdown pass. With that, it became a snowball. Kansas City does not win that game without that 99-yard interception return. The, the Chargers, you blew it, man. Continuing what you guys always do. I thought that you had uh, graduated, uh, Brandon Staley, but I see that we're going to have to keep you here. You're going to have to be retained. Kick the damn extra point. All right, it's time. Let's give them the winners. Ball and parlay. You'll start with you because you have the, the earlier game. Let's get it started. Saturday. Yeah, my favorite day. College football time, man. Do you like Saturday better than Sunday? I like Saturday way better than Sunday. It lasts longer, and it's a lot more thrills, and it's a lot more money to be made, and a lot a lot less politics. Got it. <laughs> so that's, we're going to roll with the uh, Appalachian State Mountaineers, minus 12 and a half. They're fresh off the upset of the Texas A&M Aggies. Uh, they go home, and they get a chance to face a familiar conference vote uh, in Troy. Uh, I think Sean Clark, who's the head coach of Appalachian, has those guys focused. The books are laying this line thinking that um, it's going to be a fall off because Appalachian State's going to be so happy that they were able to get one of the biggest wins in program history. But uh, the great thing about this is that they're going to flow a uh, conference folk, uh, a team that they play every year and they want to win the Sun Belt. So they know that this is a very important game. So they will definitely have uh, their attention. Uh, the coach, Sean Clark, really impressed me with his ability to make adjustments. One of the biggest adjustments we've seen already in the whole college football season is him being able to get his team that gave up 63 points on defense to North Carolina to be able to hold uh, a and with, with more talent uh, to 14 points. Just a great performance on the road in front of 100,000 uh, down at College Station. Clark is a person that's been with that program forever. He played football there from 94 to 98. Uh, he's been assistant there since 2016, so uh, he bleeds black and gold, and uh, he's used to that program dominating Troy. Now, the Trojans have lost to the Mountaineers by an average of 33 points in the last three matchups. Uh, 
Um, I just think that Appalachian State is way too talented for um, this Troy team. Appalachian State is about four deep at running back, like eight deep at receiver. Um, and they have a veteran quarterback in Chase Bryce, uh, who's uh, got a lot of playing time at Clemson when he was there. That's who recruited him originally. Uh, so he's a top-notch quarterback, and now he's in like his sixth year, man. He's off practically a pro. He's a veteran college quarterback, so uh, he'll be having guys everywhere to throw to and to hand off to that can uh, take it to the house. And the great thing about us playing this 12 and a half is the fact that Appalachian State, a very explosive offense, the most talented offense in the Sun Belt, only scored 17 points last week on the road. So I'm sure uh, that that offense will be uh, looking to get itself back into the end zone and back correcting and back putting up big points. So uh, I think that they continue what they've done to Troy the last couple of years and that they blow them out and that that 12 and a half is a bad number and we take advantage of it this week. All right, on that with you as well. <clears throat> Some of these handicaps we talked about, I think, are really intricate. They're really complicated. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different ways uh, the teams could either cover or not cover the spread. Not so here. I think this is a simple handicap. I'm taking the Browns minus six and a half, and I'm just fading Joe Flacco. I mean, you look at you, <laughs> this guy can't move. He, he, you know, at least he's a backup, right? At least he's not right. starting, but he. he I mean, and I guess he's around as a backup to, to help out the younger guy, be there in the meeting room, be there just in case of emergency. But he really can't compete. And then people are going to say, well, the Jets' defense looked pretty good against the run against Baltimore. I would argue that the Cleveland Browns are better uh, running the ball than the Baltimore Ravens. With the injuries, where you're going off just last game, these injuries, the Browns have a better offensive line, and they have two better runners because Lamar Jackson didn't run in that game. So if yeah. you take out Lamar, I got three running backs on the Browns that are better than, than the running – and Deionis, Darius Johnson didn't even play. Let's see if he gets in there this week. Uh, but with, with Chubb and Hunt, it's just too much. They're going to be able to run the ball. Uh, and I think Miles Garrett and, and his company, this defensive line, they're going to just win this game up front. They're going yeah. to win the game up front. And I know the Jets uh, – look, I guess you could say they looked all right against Baltimore's defense. I was also – the, the first game of the year, and this team's still finding itself. Uh, I think Cleveland's uh, going to be ready to go here. And I know people are going to say, you can't lay uh, six and a half with Jacoby Brissett. And I'm going to say, it's, it's not going to matter, uh, uh, you know, because he's all he needs to do is, is hand the ball off to these guys or give me that dump off to Kareem Hunt. Uh, yeah. I, I'm going to keep going against the Jets until Zach Wilson's back in this lineup. I'm going to fade Joe Flacco and take the Browns minus six and a half. Yeah, you, you're betting on Stefanski, which you should. He's a very sharp coach, and he's going to keep presenting situations where he can be successful. Uh, as you said, the line is going to kill him. They're going to kill him on offense, man. And line. both. Both, yeah. And they're, they're running backs for the Browns. I was watching a little of their game against Carolina. They both run so violently, man. You, Nick yeah. Chubb is just such a beast. Um, one of the best we've seen, man, at a running back. And then you got uh, Kareem Hunt who knows that he could have been uh, a starting running back somewhere if the incident doesn't happen to Casey. So he comes out there uh, just as ferocious as Chubb uh, trying to match his intensity. Uh, I think that they both might run for 100 yards on the Jets. So, uh, yeah, that's a great pick. The, the Jets are the gift that keeps on giving. So, guys, we're going to take the Appalachian State Mountaineers minus 12 and a half on Saturday uh, to cover at home against Troy. And my guy spread is going with the Cleveland Browns minus six and a half at home uh, against the lowly New York Jets. We appreciate you guys. Another week down. Uh, I'm already getting sad. It's just week two. <laughs> because before you know it, football season is gone, guys. So let's enjoy it while it's here. Anything for the people spread before we get out of here? No, man. It's fun to talk to you about all those games. I think you kept me off a lot of bets. And that, I'm fine to keep my outlay still low. Um, so a lot, a lot of fun having this conversation today. Yeah, man. That's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to save a friend. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Follow my guys, Fred Astaire, at Fred Astaire. Follow me at 5 Star and Baby. Spell out the 5. We'll see you guys next week. Best of luck to you all.